The American chestnut existed for approximately 10 million years in the eastern hardwood forest of North America, and it provided numerous benefits to wildlife species and other species in the ecosystem, and also was extremely important uh, culturally to humans for millennia. The American chestnut Castania dentata was thought to historically constitute three to four billion trees in the eastern hardwood forest of North America, and approximately one quarter to one half of the total tree density and forest where it grew. It was so abundant that other trees were actually named after it, like the chestnut oak, Quercus prinus. The historical range of the American chestnut was 200 million acres, which is an area slightly larger than the state of Texas. The chestnut's range extended from Maine south to northern Mississippi and from the Piedmont west to the Ohio River Valley. The American chestnut occurred in over 40 different ecoregions and on a variety of site types. Oak, which is like a cousin to chestnut because it is in the same taxonomic family, Fagaceae, was the most common forest associate with the American chestnut. The best growth of chestnut occurred in cove forests, where water was not limiting, but American chestnut was most competitive and common on intermediate side slopes and benches. It is safe to say that no other southern Appalachian species equals chestnut in the range of sites upon which it is able to establish merchantable trees or stands. Historically and traditionally, the American chestnut was important for uh, lumber and fuel wood and uh, tanning uh, in local industries. It also was a very important uh, food source for uh, Southern Appalachian communities. The American chestnut has almost a mythic quality to uh, Southern Appalachian cultures. Many folks that have lived in the Southern Appalachians remember American chestnut being part of their family farm. Family oral traditions are passed down where they talk about chestnut being on the landscape and that they would harvest chestnuts from them. They would also um, use chestnut for fence posts and uh, lumber for their barns and siding for their houses. It's almost woven throughout their daily living experience. What's it like to work with it? It's pretty nice. I didn't even, uh... I didn't even sand this. I just I just ran it because I wanted it to be kind of rustic. So I just put a coat of uh, I got two coats of clear on it, and uh, it's it's soft. It's nice. Uh, like I said, it's it's very similar to ash mm -hmm. in the grain configuration, and, and I think probably because of the patina on the wood, it probably looks uh, similar to walnut. But it's probably not when it was original. It's probably not that dark. The patina has darkened it over the years being out in the weather. Chestnut without the worms doesn't have a, much value. Right. The wormy chestnut has a lot of value. Yep. Uh, people really, if they ever want to buy the chestnut, they're going to want the wormy chestnut. In addition to the cultural significance of chestnut, the species played a very important role ecologically. It was considered a keystone species, which basically means that without the species, the ecosystem would function very differently. The American chestnut provided a stable supply of hard mast in the fall by producing nuts that were high in protein content and fiber. Species like black bear, wild turkey, and white-tailed deer consumed chestnut and even preferred it over other hard mast species like hickory or oak. The American chestnut was probably a consistent producer of mast because it flowers later in the spring, especially compared to oak species. Flowers typically formed after late season frosts, which could damage flower and mass production. The effect that American chestnut had on insect species, like the appropriately named and now rarely seen chestnut sawfly, is relatively unknown. There is a lot we just don't understand about how American chestnut affected food webs, wildlife habitat, or other ecological processes, like roosting for bird and bat species, or soil water availability and chemistry. The first non-native disease that negatively affected chestnut was root rot caused by Phytophthora cinnamomi. It arrived in the early 1800s, probably from Southeast Asia, 
American chestnut shows little resistance to this non-native pathogen. Die-off of chestnuts and chinkapins was noted as early as the 1850s and 1860s in the Piedmont region of the southeastern United States. The disease causes roots to atrophy and leaves typically wilt and turn yellow prior to the tree's death. The chestnut was formerly abundant in the Piedmont region, down to the country between the Catawba and Yadkin rivers, but within the last 30 years they have mostly perished. They are now found east of the Blue Ridge only on higher ridges and spurs of mountains. They have suffered injury here and are dying out, both here and beyond the Blue Ridge. They are much less fruitful than they were a generation ago, and the crop is much more uncertain. Chestnut blight disease caused by a fungus, Cryphonectria parasitica, arrived in the United States in the 1890s from imported Japanese nursery stock. The disease was first reported in 1904 at the Bronx Zoo in New York. The American chestnut did not evolve with the blight, so genes for resistance to this disease did not develop. By the 1950s, chestnut blight disease had virtually eliminated the American chestnut throughout its range. A tree that had existed for 10 million years was wiped out in less than 60 years by a non-native pathogen. So you can see underneath the bark, it's kind of dead and brown, which means that it's killing the cambium layer of the tree. If I go up here and cut into the tree, you'll see a very different color because that's healthy tissue there, green and healthy. Versus down here is brown and very unhealthy where the um, blight is basically exuding that oxalic acid into the tree that lowers the pH of the tree and the tree really can't handle it and will eventually the cells will start to die and eventually the tree will be girdled completely around the circumference of it and the top will then die. The chestnut blight enters the tree through wounds and natural age cracks that form on the bark. Cankers then form on the tree that often appear slightly swollen around the margins of the canker and sunken in the middle. The blight produces sexual spores that are easily spread by wind up to six miles, and asexual spores are spread more locally by rain splash. Spores are produced inside orange-colored stromata that protrude from the bark surface. The chestnut blight cannot live in the soil so the American chestnut can survive by sprouting from old stumps. Sometimes these sprouts can live for decades, continuously dying back and re-sprouting as they are infected by the chestnut blight. Occasionally, an American chestnut will live long enough to flower and bear fruit. These trees probably have some low levels of resistance or they have a blight strain that is weak or hypovirulent. These chestnut tree survivors provide very important pollen and genetic resources for restoration efforts that are currently underway to breed for resistance. The chestnut blight is ubiquitous and it cannot be contained. It actually infects other tree species like the scarlet oak, causing a butt swell at the base of the tree. However, the blight doesn't kill these trees. So even if there are no chestnut trees around, the blight can still be in the area on these other host trees. The chestnut blight is also a saprophyte and it can live on dead logs for a number of years. Historical efforts to control blight through cutting around infected trees failed. Control through chemicals like fungicides are restricted to small groups of trees and are not practical on a large scale. The chestnut blight brought one of the most widespread ecological disasters ever known, but forests have recovered. The American chestnut was quickly replaced by other species like oak, maple, and ash to help form the forest we see today. The effect of the demise of the chestnut is not well understood. Efforts to restore this once iconic tree are underway. The American chestnut was a really important tree species historically. It existed in Eastern North America for about 10 million years. It had a range from Southern Canada, south into Mississippi, east from the Piedmont, west to uh, the Ohio River Valley. 
So it had about a 200 million acre range and it uh, was thought to occupy about three to four billion trees. It was extremely versatile, um, extremely widespread. It was thought to be a keystone species and it was here for 10 million years and it was virtually wiped out in less than 60 from the blight that came in. Breeding for resistance to the chestnut blight started almost immediately after the blight was discovered. Scientists realized that they could cross Asian chestnut species like Chinese and Japanese chestnut with the American chestnut to get blight resistance. But the trick was to get a tree that not only had blight resistance, but also had good timber form and grew fast like the American chestnut. In the mid-1980s, an approach was developed called back cross breeding. With back cross breeding, a hybrid tree is produced that theoretically has 94% of its genome from the American chestnut and 6% from an Asian chestnut species like the Chinese chestnut. We refer to these trees as BC3F3s or the third back cross generation. This breeding work has taken many decades to carry out and it is still ongoing. From a regional standpoint, though we manage vast landscapes of southern pine and upland hardwoods, we never want to lose sight of the conservation of forest tree species that are threatened, or in the case of the American chestnut, were lost. We want to support and be an active part of the chestnut reintroduction as we continue working with our partners, such as the Southern Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service, University of Tennessee, and the American Chestnut Foundation, and provide test sites for chestnut plantings on the Southern Region National Forest. We established our very first research test planting of American chestnut in 2009, and actually where I'm standing is the very first research test planting of American chestnuts that have ever been established on the National Forest System using the most advanced breeding material available at the time. These test plantings represent a culmination of over 100 years of research and breeding efforts that have been underway to get a blight-resistant American chestnut established back into its native range. We knew that we had to grow the best seedlings possible for planting so that the trees would be competitive in the woods and would escape deer browsing more quickly. So we grew the trees from nuts in a commercial nursery for one year to maximize their growth and size prior to planting. For every tree we were gonna plant, we counted the seedling's roots and measured its height and its stem diameter. We sorted the trees into an experimental design for planting so we can empirically test the effects of breeding, genetics, and seedling size on overall field performance over time. We established 13 plantings starting in 2009, and we also established plantings in 2010, 2011, in 2015. In all, we've planted about 4,500 trees in three states on three national forests, the Cherokee, the Nantahala, and the George Washington Jefferson. We established this planting in 2009 with nuts that were collected in 2007 from the American Chestnut Foundation's orchard in Meadowview, Virginia. In this particular planting where I'm standing, we planted around 400 trees total. And about half of those are the BC3 F3 trees or the third generation backcross trees, which are the most advanced breeding generation available um, for us to test. And those trees are predicted to be highly blight resistant, but also look and behave like an American chestnut. So we wanna see if the trees we planted out here are gonna have those desirable characteristics of the American chestnut, but have the desirable blight resistance of the Asian species like the Chinese chestnut. So one of the important things that we're looking at in these plantings is not just whether or not the tree is gonna be resistant, but whether the tree is gonna be able to compete with all of these native uh, species around it. We have poplars and uh, here's a small poplar and there's birches and tree and striped maples and trees like that, that this tree has to be able to get its head above and get the sunlight in order to stay competitive and then eventually, hopefully, produce fruit um, and reproduce. 
As of the 12th growing season after planting, about 60% of the trees that we planted are alive. So 40% of them have died. Um, the majority of them died early on, uh, right after planting. And that's kind of common for hardwood plantings. Um, trees go through what you call planting shock where they have been growing in a nursery and you take them out of that nice environment and put them out into the real world and they kind of go into a shock period. So it can sometimes actually kill them, but also trees die for other unknown reasons that we don't totally understand. Um, they could have gotten browsed too much by deer. They could have gotten uh, defoliated by uh, insects. They could have gotten cicada damage. So there's lots of reasons that trees die other than just getting the chestnut blight. And that's really important for us to document over time to give managers that baseline information for how these trees are gonna survive and perform over the long term. This tree where I'm standing has really good form. It's tall, it's straight. Uh, it's going straight up into the canopy. Most of its leaves are up in the canopy and they're getting direct sunlight, which is gonna be really good for nut production and flower production long term. Whereas a Chinese chestnut is going to grow a little bit more shrubby in appearance and be shorter and have more forking. Um, and it's just not gonna be as competitive as a pure American chestnut. And what we found is that the B3, F3 trees look identical to the American chestnut. Um, and they're growing pretty similarly to the pure American chestnut, although slightly less uh, fast than the American chestnut but that could change over time. The tallest trees on this site reached 40 feet in 10 years, um, and that's pretty remarkable. Uh, they're averaging around 25 feet in height growth right now on average across the entire stand after 12 years. The BC3 F3 trees are doing significantly better in terms of blight resistance compared to the pure American chestnuts that we planted. About half of the BC3 F3 trees are still blight free compared to only about 20% of the American chestnuts. Two of the biggest problems we face with restoration of American chestnut other than blight resistance is deer browse on newly planted seedlings and Phytophthora root rot. We can mitigate for the deer browse by planting larger size seedlings and using tree shelters. We mitigate for root rot by being very careful about site selection to plant on well-drained sites. We've documented other non-native pests that have had some negative impacts to our plantings. The Asiatic oak weevil defoliates trees but doesn't seem to kill them. The Asian gall wasp lays eggs inside of newly developing buds and inhibits growth and flowering. The ambrosia beetle attacks weakened or dying trees. Restoration really has to be about more than planting a blight-resistant tree. We have to also consider the impacts of other non-native pests that are here now and those that are likely to come. Working with Dr. Clark is an important part of a National Forest System uh, restoration goals and objectives because she's focusing on the restoration of the American chestnut. The Silvicultural Toolbox is relatively unknown for restoring American chestnut. As Dr. Clark's research develops further, we begin to understand more information about how American chestnut competes within the local communities that it's growing in. And based on that information, we can design treatments that are beneficial to creating conditions for American chestnut to survive and, and thrive as, as we look at restoration opportunities. These research test plantings represent over 100 years of research and breeding efforts. Um, we're only in the second decade of research in these test plantings, and American chestnuts can live over 300 years old. So we're really in the early phases of understanding how this tree is going to perform out in the real world forest conditions like you see here today. So we think if you can get a tree that is going to maintain blight resistance over time, you will be able to restore these trees back into their native range.